Oh, well, welcome everyone to our 21st virtual shadowing session. Uh, today, we have a very special guest uh, whom you're gonna meet very shortly, uh, Dr. Gutierrez, and she's gonna be talking about uh, psychiatry and the theme of this presentation is gonna be progress, not perfection. And I'm sure Dr. Gutierrez can talk more about that very shortly. Uh, next slide, Dr. Gutierrez. Uh, just before we start, I just want to introduce a working group. Uh, we have Ray, Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Alana, uh, Rachel, uh, Miriam, and Rohit. And of course, none of this would be possible without Dr. Fowler and Dr. Morchetti. Um, next slide. Um, and then just some upcoming sessions. So next week, we're going to be joined uh, by neurologist Dr. Novakovich. Uh, and the week following, uh, we're going to be joined by Dr. Derricks, and she's gonna be talking about research in medicine. And um, that last week, uh, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Lavia. Uh, they're gonna be talking about pediatric endocrinology. Uh, Dr. Fowler, is there anything else you wanna expand on these, uh, on these guests? Just to say we have many upcoming wonderful sessions for you. We're now at uh, 20 sessions and almost 40 hours of virtual shadowing for you online. We have over 27,000 participants who've signed up with us from over 760 nations. Um, what we have tried to do here is to give you the information and the experience that you need to be able to have the shadowing activities so that you can make your application to professional school, whether it's medical school or PA school. We welcome and encourage your participation. We are scheduled out already through the end of the year and into January. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as I've said in previous sessions, as long as you keep coming back, we're going to keep coming here and sharing um, some very, very exciting specialties that are coming up. The one next week is going to be very exciting. Dr. Novakovic will be talking about, for example, she runs the stroke network for North Texas. She is the one that when someone has a stroke, she takes them to the cath lab and pulls clots out of their brain. It's going to be very, very exciting. Dr. Derricks, who will be speaking on the third, is my boss, and she is one of the truly recognized researchers in the realm of emergency medicine worldwide with a specialty in acute coronary system management. So we have a lot of exciting, uh, exciting uh, talks coming up from, uh, for you, and please come back and keep joining us. Please take the exams online. That's what they're there for. Uh, we're here for you, virtual shadowing. It's all of us as a team working together. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there will be a question and answer session twice during this talk. There'll be one in the middle. And what we'll be doing, put your questions into chat. Please keep them on topic. And we will then sort and write the questions on high, medium, and low um, uh, value questions for Dr. Gutierrez. Uh, we'll have a session in the middle, and we will have a session at the end as well. So we encourage you to put your questions on. We'll be following chat very closely and monitoring these questions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so it is an absolute delight for me to be able to present someone who has made my life so easy. I'm an emergency physician by trade. I work in the busiest emergency department in the United States, which means one of the busiest in the world. Um, we see, we are a full service trauma, burn, medicine, psychiatric emergency center. And a critical part of the care we give are, is in the realm of the issues of mental health and the enormous spectrum that this presents to medicine broadly, to the patients particularly, and to the healthcare providers who care for them. I will be there. I'm an old man, you've heard many times. I'll be in there and I'll be up to my ears and alligators taking care of patients and I'll have several mental health patients that I just cannot help and I'm tired and I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself getting annoyed and angry and I'll put in the consult the psychiatry and this angel, Nicole Gutierrez will come over and just make our life so easy with her gentle, smiling, uh, intuitive, but hard scientific manner of approaching these patients that we become so frustrated because we can't help them. Tonight, Nicole is going to share with us 
the way she got into psychiatry, what led her in that path as a pre-med person, and then what her life is like, especially with attention to life in a very busy, difficult uh, emergency receiving center. Nicole, you are the angel that makes my life so easy, and I know that uh, Dr. Salazar feels the same way. Welcome to Virtual Shadowing. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dr. Fowler. Um, so I was going to begin this talk, basically outline the beginning of the following things. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with what a psychiatrist truly does, so we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, also talking about um, going into psychiatry, getting into medical school. I don't know how many of you all have truly considered um, going into psychiatry. And then I'll we'll also talk about um, kind of walking through a patient that we might see in the ER um, and kind of what we do as psychiatrists, how our thought process works um, when working with some of these people. And please, as we go through, please write your questions. Um, I wanna make sure that this is as tailored to you all as possible. Um, so stay with us. Um, so I also just want to give a big thank you to Dr. Fowler. Um, I've truly enjoyed working with you in the ER. I love seeing your interaction with the patients. Um, it's just been very, from a clinician, still been doing this for a few years. Um, love seeing your experience with working with patients. I definitely want to thank you, Ani and Rachel, as you guys and, and the rest of you all have kind of put this whole, this whole thing together for all of us. Um, so just kind of starting off with choosing a career in psychiatry. Um, so because all of you all are pre-med as well as pre-PA students, um, initially I just kind of, so I went to UTMB um, in Galveston, so I just kind of went to their website and just kind of screenshotted some of their requirements for you all. Um, so of course, English, uh, making sure you get those courses, those prereqs, biological sciences, uh, mathematics, physics, chemistry. So definitely I'd always recommend whatever um, the schools you're interested in, they all should have very similar requirements, but just going through those actual schools and looking to see what those requirements are and make sure that you're meeting those requirements for being able to retriculate into their programs. Um, so the MCAT is this lovely test you guys all um, need to study for and preparing for um, as part of the equalizer regarding students coming from all across the US and world entering into the next schools. So, just doing a good job of really trying to study for that and continuously improving your skills on those tests is really important. I'm a very big proponent of group studying. So if you guys can be studying in groups for these tests, it's really important. Um, another thing that I always think is really important that I know when I was in um, college that was really stressed to me is just early applications. Um, I looked up the one for this year, it's October 14th, but I'm pretty sure they're pretty similar every year but just making sure that you're applying early and really getting those applications in. Um, it's just really crucial for those. Um, so once you enter medical school, um, in traditional curriculum, some schools have started doing different curriculums where, especially UT Southwestern, where the curriculum does not follow two years of book learning and then two years of clerkships. But for the traditional curriculum, during those first two years of medical school, you will get a class um, that introduces you to psychiatry, introduces you to the pathology, the different mental illnesses, introduces you to medications that manage psychiatry. Um, and then third year, which traditional curriculum would be your clerkship year, um, everyone has a six week psychiatry rotation where you'll get to do inpatient experiences, you'll get to do outpatient experiences, um, and if you really enjoy that, you can also fourth year start doing more kind of more electives in psychiatry. Um, then you do the application for psychiatry. And if you do match into psychiatry, um, psychiatry for general is a four year residency. And then if you want to specialize in one of the fellowships that psychiatry offers, um, most of them total about five years. So you do four years general psychiatry, you can do addiction psychiatry, which this talk will be about addictions, which I'm not an addiction psychiatrist, but I really, really enjoy addiction psychiatrist, psychiatry, working in the ER, we do a lot of addiction psychiatry. Um, there's also Chana Lesson Psychiatry, which is a two-year psychiatry fellowship, um, consult liaison, which deals with patients who are admitted medically. Um, those to be a psychiatrist, if you want to do a fellowship and get a further education specialization in that field. And there's forensic psychiatry, which deals with a lot of like um, criminal psychiatry. It also deals with psychiatry of patients who are incarcerated. Um, so that would be another specialty that you could go into through psychiatry. 
Um, and then for those of you who are going on the physician assistant um, route rather than the medical school route, um, I kind of had, we, we work with a lot with PAs and nurse practitioners in the ER. So there's psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, and PAs that all rotate through the ER. So I kind of um, asked some of my clinicians, my fellow clinicians about their route. So um, Baylor, Scott, and White, again, I'm from the Houston area. So Baylor, Scott, and White just kind of went to their website and looked at their prereq requirements. Um, kind of similar to medical school, but they wanted you to have like anatomy, physiology, microbiology, you can kind of go through the different biological sciences, the different chemistries that you're going to need, um, the different humanities, um, as well as some, they also want math like statistics. So again, just familiarizing yourself with those requirements for the different schools versus the different programs that you're interested in pursuing. Um, while medical school, they want you to take the MCAT or pre um, for physician assistants, they want you to do the GRE. Um, so same things though, study, group studies best. There's a lot of programs you can kind of purchase and, and they'll kind of help um, give you a timeline to follow as well as material that you should be mastering. Um, and then their admission for, at least for Baylor, seems to be a little bit different. Theirs was August as their applications are due then. So I don't know when they actually could submit them early, but again, application timeline is really important. So making sure you're getting all those applications in as soon as possible. Um, and then with physician assistants, when they're through their schools, they'll also rotate through all the medical specialties. Um, and even when I was in medical school, we rotated with the physician assistants, those, those individuals in school too. So you'll work alongside them with the attendings. Um, and then when you finish physician assistants, which I think is around two years, 26 months, um, you can actually go into any specialty that you're interested in. But I do know they also have, a, I think it's called CAQ that you can take after you've done, I think, physician assistants after you've been working about a year to get further specialization in psychiatry. So if that's the route you're interested in that'd be kind of the steps to becoming a profession in psychiatry. Um, so I want to start off this with one of the questions that when Dr. Fowler approached me in the ER um, regarding these patients. Um, so one of the things that he asked me was, why do at times when dealing with some of these, I'll call them difficult patients, do some people tend to get frustrated and other people tend to kind of, as he said, kind of enjoy the, not, not enjoy, the, but kind of come with these patients and not feel necessarily frustrated and angry and easily upset after having an experience with them. Um, one of the things that I always like to think about is, I know when I was in college, one of the, the points that our professors would always talk about is ending pain. So we don't get into medicine to 100% fix people and fix their problems. We, get, we want to understand their pain and understand their suffering and see what we can do to help them move in the direction that helps lessen that, that burden, that pain that they're um, working through. Um, working in the ER, especially Parkland, which as Dr. Fowler said, is one of the business ERs, not the business ER. I think in 2018, it was the business ER um, in the US as far as patient contacts. Um, a lot of people suffer with drug and alcohol addiction. We deal a lot with different substances. Um, people coming in intoxicated, people coming in at withdrawal states and all kind of the spectrum regarding that. Um, and dealing with that patient population because addiction is such a difficult um, thing to overcome. One of the things we struggle with these patients is them frequently presenting. Um, some of the worst people, some of the most frequently we'll see them multiple times within the same week. Um, and doing that can feel kind of frustrating to work with these people when they keep coming in with substance use, keep coming in intoxicated, keep asking for help, but then it's like you do everything you can for them. Um, then tomorrow, here they come back in. It's like, didn't we talk about this? Didn't we give steps? And we agreed on what you need to do to get better. And so definitely as a healthcare provider, um, I think our training is very good when it comes to diagnosing mental illness, diagnosing substance use, providing them treatment, because some of these, especially like alcohol, can actually be lethal, and especially the intoxicated syndrome can be lethal, the withdrawal syndrome can be lethal, and so we get a lot of good training in the hard science of how to deal with the illness that is before us, um, but sometimes as far as improving this patient's quality of life, sometimes that kind of gets pushed to the side, so we don't get as much training regarding that, um, and definitely, I don't think any of us get into this not to have our patients do well. And so that's also something that we struggle with as providers is I want this patient to do well. They want to do well. They're coming here for help. Um, but what can we do to help them continue to improve and not just continue this cycle or downward spiral of, of the consequences that come with substance use? 
Um, let me see the next slide. I can see it a little bit. Nice. So when it comes to psychiatry, we talk about, you have this term SMI, severe mental illness. Um, and when we talk about that, we talk about some of the more disabling illnesses that people have. So we talk about depression at the most extreme form of depression. We call it major depressive disorder. We talk about anxiety. Um, there's multiple different varieties of anxiety, but I just kind of harpered on generalized anxiety disorder. It's probably one of the more prevalent ones. Um, bipolar disorder, which is severely disabling for people who are struggling with both poles of their mood, meaning depression and anxiety. Um, we also deal with another mental illness, schizophrenia. And then ones we frequently see that I think we all struggle a lot with like are the substance use disorders. And so I kind of highlight alcohol use for here because that's the one we're going to focus most prevalent on, most heavily on right now. Let's see. Let me skip through a few. And so when, um, especially with psychiatry, we do a lot with cognitions, thought processes, mindsets, um, what things get in the way of people's mindsets. And so I titled this presentation, Progress Not Perfection, because I definitely think at times, because of the rigors it takes for us to become healthcare professionals, because of the standards we're held to by ourselves, by our communities, by our government, by all these different all these different agencies and things, um, I definitely think our standard is we want everything to be perfect. We want the patient outcomes to be perfect. We expect our our work to be perfect, but at times that becomes almost an unattainable goal. <laughs> even though that's the standard we're held to, it's not necessarily an attainable goal in all aspects of our care. Um, and so I titled this Progress Not Perfection because sometimes I think reframing our goal, reframing our um, requirements we put on ourselves definitely needs to be taken into account, that we need to progress towards improving our care, progress toward improving the patient's pain, but not necessarily expecting a perfect outcome or a perfect result from everything that we're doing. And so in regards to substance use, um, I just kind of pulled some statistics from NAMI, um, which basically stands for um, mental, sorry, a National Alliance of Mental Illness. According to them, um, mental illness, as pretty many of us know, is very prevalent in our society. Um, about one in five people have a mental illness, which and generally speaking, ranges from depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia. There's all other different types of mental illness. We're talking about autism spectrum disorder, but generally when we think about mental illness, those are kind of the four big ones that we're usually referring to. Um, and of those people who have depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, 5% of them will experience severe mental illness, which means it affects their ability to function. It affects their ability to hold employment. It affects their ability to develop um, good relationships with friends, family, coworkers. It affects their ability to have stable housing because you can't provide for yourself regarding a stable income. You can't provide for yourself regarding stable relationships. It makes it hard for you to provide for yourself for having stable housing. Um, and so let me see how that affects. And a lot of these people will also, what we call dual diagnosis in psychiatry, have a mental illness as well as a co-recurring or associated medical thing a co-occurring substance use disorder. About 3.7% of Americans have both a mental illness as well as a substance use disorder. Um, and since we're focusing on substance use disorder, um, drinking. Um, both men and women struggle with alcohol use disorder, but it definitely tends to be slightly more prevalent in the male population than in the female population. Um, so many people drink, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have a substance use disorder. Um, binge drinking, which just means drinking on average eight, sub eight, eight drinks, which is not necessarily what we consider a drink, but eight um, units of a drink. So alcohol, beer, wine, whatever that may be. Um, and excess is, is a binge drink, is binge drinking. Um, but while men do tend to binge drink more than females, um, not all people who binge drink are alcoholics. About 4.5% of men in the population are alcoholics and about 2.5% of females are alcoholics. Um, and so understanding alcoholism, not just from the um, pathology aspect of it is really important. Um, not just from the severe, uh, the severe, mental, severe medical consequences of overdose um, or the severe mental consequences of withdrawal syndrome. But also from a psychiatry perspective, we also start talking about the models of substance use, which range from the social model, 
Um, are you drinking because your peers are drinking? Are you drinking because you come from a family where alcohol use is very prevalent? So there's a lot of alcohol around the home. So some of these people, especially when you start getting some of these alcohol histories, you will find that some of them really because maybe their parents struggle with alcoholism and there's alcohol just kind of laying around the home. Some of these people can really start drinking alcohol at a very young age, maybe like eight, 10, 11, 12, and really start developing substance use development disorders very at a very young age because of their social environment they're in. Um, there's a psychological model for substance use that also has to be kind of taken into consideration working with these patients. Um, psychological being when people have uh, more mental illness, more depression, more anxiety, they maybe try to treat their symptoms with substance use. Um, when people have certain personality spectrum disorders, especially like antisocial, they're more prevalent, conduct disorder, they're more likely to use substances. Um, there's also like a neuropsychological model, which kind of gets into the addiction model of, psych of um, substance use where you get into like the craving for substance use. Um, there's also like the pharmacological model, which has to deal with like the rate at which you're using substances, the route at which you're using substances, how your receptors start kind of being affected. There's also genetic models for substance use. So some families just have a stronger genetic prevalence of using substances. Some people, the way they metabolize alcohol makes them more likely to become addicted to alcohol or not addicted to alcohol in the other spectrum. When working with these patients, all these things have to be taken into consideration. Um, but for my preference, I definitely think the one that I tend to focus on the most is the psychological model. Um, and having said that, one of the things I think is most important to begin with is really instilling hope in the patient. Hope that things can get better for them. Hope that they can have a life um, that is more tuned to their goals. And I think it's always important to attune our goals to what their goals are. Because at times our goals are 100% sobriety, 100% not using, 100% um, going long periods of time without using alcohol. That may not be their goals. Their goals may be, I want to be able to have one beer a night and be fine, not have 20 beers a night. I want to be able to have one beer with my family at social events and not binge drink to the point of being passed out, the police being called, having all these disruptions in my life due to my substance abuse. So I think always, um, trying to align our goals with the patient goals is important, um, as opposed to just saying, this is our goal, 100% sobriety. Um, but having said that, at times as a profession, we can struggle with trying to identify the patient's goals, allow them to express their goals, and us um, aligning with those. One of the things I kind of put in here is the word like cognitive dissonance, which means um, being able to separate um, our struggle with the patient's struggle. Um, simply put, when we kind of have separation of that, our emotional goals with the patient's emotional goals with the patient's actual goals, um, sometimes that can cause us as providers to kind of lose hope. And at times when we lose hope in the patient's ability to get better, um, we start in a way um, being counterproductive to that. Um, and so I wanted to start off this presentation with the first part of how we kind of become counterproductive to the patient, and then we'll have like our question section, and then what we could do to help and still hope in ourselves and still hope in our patients um, in kind of actionable steps. Um, so I love the picture of the butterfly, so I put it here. But um, I always think the things we tell ourselves are really important. So I kind of put little affirmations or um, different things like that throughout the presentation. So one of the things I start off with, I give myself permission to be okay where I am and know that I'm doing my best. So as a clinician, sometimes we can start feeling hopeless when everything that we've been trained with, all the experiences we have, we're giving that to the patient. The patient just isn't receiving them or they are doing the actionable steps that we have talked about and sometimes even agreed to. Um, so knowing that you're doing your best with this patient, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes is... Um, we have to learn to make that okay with ourselves. Um, well, I know the goal of our future patients um, is to help them. I think the starting point is not the interaction, is not our patient, it's actually starting with us. And so in psychiatry, I always talk about, we have people who are always kind of talking about the relationships with their people, the relationships with work, the relationships with their spouse, the relationship with friends. From the psychiatric perspective, I always tell them, let's turn that a little bit. And let's start the conversation with our relationship with ourselves. Um, what are our views? How do we feel about the situations? How are we expressing that? 
Um, and I tell patients always, let's start with the person in the room. You're here today, let's focus on you. And so I also wanna iterate that with you all today. Let's focus on you all and not necessarily focus on the future of who you're working with. Um, I like the saying, let's not put the cart, the horse before the cart. Um, the way I view this is as a skill. I think all of us can grow and develop our skills as interacting with ourselves, expressing ourselves to the people we're working with. Um, we all spend this time, this hard time going through college, going through medical school, developing these, developing ourselves to be good clinicians. But just like we develop the skills in hard sciences, we also need to work on developing our skills in soft sciences. Um, so as I said, give yourself permission to allow yourself to grow and develop. Um, I think important in growth and develop is developing a love for growth and development. Sometimes we become very hard on ourselves and kind of just want to shut down, say this is hard, just kind of make an excuse and move on. But truly developing a love and enjoyment for that challenge is really, is really important. Um, giving yourself permission to acknowledge your errors is very challenging to do, but it's hard to grow if we don't allow ourselves to accept and acknowledge our own shortcomings. Um, unfortunately, the only way to kind of transform to this beautiful butterfly, this beautiful condition that really enjoys patients, that patients really enjoy working with and really get good results from, is to understand that change is hard and that you have to become, be able to accept that errors will occur and you grow from those errors. Um, so I had this lecture that I, a substance use lecture that um, I sat through, gosh, many years ago, we're preparing for my psychiatry boards. And this saying has just always stuck with me. Um, and I feel like this is kind of the spiral that happens when people use drugs. So first the man takes a drink. First you knowingly take a drink of alcohol. You want to, you, whatever. It's a very thoughtful process. Next thing you know, especially as the substance use continues, then you find yourself, the drink is taking a drink. Now you're not even really aware of what you're doing. You're just drinking because, well, I had three beers, why don't I have five, why don't I have six, why don't I have seven? And lastly, um, which is when we actually probably get to our substance users who are addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, um, the drink then starts consuming the person. Um, the addiction cycle starts happening, you're craving alcohol, now um, the drink is almost controlling you. And so um, our next, I kind of have a little antidote or a little um, example of a patient that we may encounter in the ER. So um, Mr. Smith, I just gave him a fictitious name, is a 31-year-old man, is found unresponsive, lying on the ground in the community. Um, a concerned passerby calls 911 and an ambulance arrives and brings Mr. Smith to the emergency room. Um, of course, at the time you first see him, he can't tell you how much he drank, but later on we found out that he drank 12, 24-ounce beers that day. Um, he drank so much to the point that he just became unconscious, which is why he's found down in the community. Um, and fortunately, um, as he kind of wakes more and is able to talk more, um, your interaction with him is, this is fifth ER visit this week. Um, let's say you're an ER doctor, you've only been working in the ER for one year, and you personally over the last year have seen him 15 times. So kind of setting up a challenging patient and, and is challenged to help him. Um, in psychiatry, we love to do a lot of kind of meditative, a lot of kind of thinking. So I definitely think it's hard to progress if you can't see it in your mind's eye, as we say. So I want you just to kind of take a few minutes, and just kind of think. Imagine that this is your patient and you're having an interaction with him. Um, before you knock on the door, what are you kind of thinking? And I know a lot of you all are pre-students, so pre-med, pre-PA students. So the actual interaction with patients, I know um, you don't have a lot of experience with that, but the interaction you have with a patient really is no different than the interaction you have in any other job you may have held in the past, any other um, activity you may have been doing where you're kind of serving the community. So thinking about this in that sense of how do you plan on serving this person that you're in front of? Um, how do you see yourself interacting with him from the time you open the door, before, during the time that you're speaking with him, as you're kind of taking down notes, however you may be doing that, to the time that you exit the room with him? What do you see yourself kind of saying at the beginning as you kind of introduce yourself? Um, even things such as, where are you looking? Um, especially in ERs, especially in medicine, a lot of our medical records are now all electronic. So in psychiatry and the ER, we carry computers, 
Um, not everyone does, but some clinicians will. We have computers in all the rooms. Um, some clinicians carry it on paper. Where are your eyes when you're speaking with this person? Are you focused on your note taking? Are you focused on the person in front of you? Are you seeing his changes in his expressions and his affects and his energy levels as you're speaking with them? Um, how is your tone of voice? A lot of times, um, our thoughts can come through in tones that are not the most appeasing or appealing for others' ears. And we don't realize that. We're like, well, I'm being nice, but you're kind of being curt, you're kind of being short. Maybe your questions are kind of short and to the point as opposed to being more open-ended. They tend to become more closed. Um, and at the end, how do you end the assessment? How do you exit the room? Um, what does that look like? What does that sound like? Um, where are your eyes looking as you're exiting the room? So all those things are important. All those things affect the response you get from the patient. All those things affect the feeling the patient is getting from your interaction with him. So um, again, talking about pathology, how can all these things kind of not be in the best interest of our patients when we're kind of interacting with the patient that we find challenging as a clinician? Um, so hope. <laughs> um, hope, I think, is very, very important because when we have hope in our patients getting better, it shows in the interaction we have with our patients. Um, I like the saying, hopeful people are realistic that the journey might not be smooth sailing and they trust that they can navigate it. So our hope that by us interacting with this patient that we are, again, doing something to help this person move forward in their life, not perfect. This may not be the day they become sober. This may not be the day that they stop coming to the ER acutely and talks about alcohol, but what can we do to help start dropping, I almost call it like little, I almost might have like um, Hansel and Grell with the little seeds as they were, the little pieces of bread they were dropping as they were trying to leave a path back to the house. What little seeds or what little pieces of breadcrumbs are we dropping that kind of helps this person change and get moving in the right direction over time? So one of the things that I start to think about with dropping breadcrumbs, with instilling hope in this patient, with instilling hope in myself so that we can actually help this patient kind of turn over time is I love this theorist, Bobby, Bobby. Um, and so his theory really does a lot with attachment. Um, and attachment theory, I guess, in a nutshell, explains how our lack of hope in our patients can be counterintuitive or counterproductive to them improving. Um, we know that from psychiatry, um, a lot from like the Freudian theories, that people will reenact the relationships they have as early children. So whether that means their early relationships are with their parents, whoever their caregiver may be. And so one of the theories that I think really kind of hones into difficult patients and our difficult encounters and our feelings towards our patients who are difficult is what's called maternal deprivation theory, which Bowlby and Robertson kind of um, put together. And the consequence of maternal deprivation, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit later, is essentially protest, despair, and detachment. And it's kind of how the child reacts to these situations to help preserve their inner self, to help preserve their, um, and by saying inner self, help preserve their well being. How do I continue to function in these difficult situations? And while the research is done on children, which because their brains aren't as developed as adults, the way they express themselves is much simpler is much more simply expressed. Um, you can see a child protest and you can see a child at a grocery store, which you've all seen, I have kids, so the child gets angry. I want this. No, they throw themselves on the ground, they scream, they cry, that's them protesting. It's very easily seen in children. Adults are a bit more complicated because we just have so many other life experiences. We have so many other filters that we can um, not express these things in the same way. Um, but having said that, Working as a provider, we are put under a lot of constraints. We have documentation that we need to do. We need to make sure medically this patient is doing well. That puts a lot of stress on us. We also have time constraints. We don't have three hours to spend with every patient in the ER. We can do our best with the time we have, but all those things kind of put constraints and stress on us, um, which at times we are trained in science. So we tend to put the science kind of before some of the psychological interactions we're actually having with this patient. Um, so basically what all these are saying is emotions lead to our behaviors. The way we think leads to the way we feel about situations and the way we feel about situations leads to the way that we speak, do, act, however, leads to the behaviors 
that we will reenact over and over again. And again, a lot of these behaviors are so ingrained in us from our own young childhood experiences that they become what we call automatic. And so we don't even realize sometimes that we're doing them. Um, I hear like, I can think of the patient that I was seeing the other day. Well, that's just how I am. That's just how I am. And so sometimes we make excuses to reinforce some of the things that we're doing because we just find us, that's just who I am. Um, but hopefully by the end of the day, I really want to impress upon you all that even some of the simplest changes that we can make in ourselves can develop our own hope in our patients and help us gain insight so that we can help you develop, we'll talk about mindset, a healthy growth mindset that we can kind of continue with. Because when we lose hope in our patients, I think the biggest concern is um, it causes us to kind of lose meaning in our work. And when we don't have meaning, the engagements we have with people aren't fulfilling. Um, and that kind of leads us to have burnout. So I think continuously re 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 reiterating that the hope starts with us. And when we have hope in our patient, it allows us to really enjoy our work. It leads us to kind of continue to grow in our work. And at least our patients also getting better over time. Even our challenging ones, they too will get better over time. Um, and so a lot of times we have ethics. We have medical ethics from all of these different organizations that kind of work with psychiatry and work with medicine. At the graduation ceremony, we all take the Hippocratic Oath, which the beginning is first do no harm. Um, the American Medical Association, I kind of Googled their medical ethics. Theirs is, their first one is, a physician shall be dedicated to providing competent medical care. We're all competently trained with compassion and respect for human dignity and rights. But what does that mean? So we can say all these things and we can all write about these things, but how does that, how do we express that in the interaction that we have with our patients? Um, so I believe that mindset is so important for us striving to have good behavioral interactions with our patients. Um, as writers, I think reflecting on our imperfections is really important. Acknowledging our imperfections is really important because you can't chase something that you don't acknowledge. Um, I believe that striving to improve ourselves is really important, us being compassionate, respectful. Um, and so the next half of the section, we'll kind of talk about our half of the conversation, kind of gives concrete examples of that. So let's take you through a real life case that happens in the emergency room. Like how could this interaction actually occur? So how does this play out? So I want you guys to take a few minutes to kind of answer some of these questions. If you were working with Mr. Smith, how would you feel? You've been in the ER for a year. You've seen him 15 times. You've looked through his chart. In the last week, he's been here five times. How are you feeling with him? And then because our thoughts and emotions are not necessarily new, what in the past have you felt that same way? What memories kind of start to be triggered? What memories start to kind of surface when you think about those past experiences? And then based upon that, our beliefs that we start having about ourselves. What beliefs do you start having about yourself, about this experience that you're having? So I'd like you guys all just kind of take a few minutes, just kind of think about that. So back to our patient. So if we're talking with the patient, so here's the provider. You kind of come in. So can you tell me a bit about what led you coming to the, led to EMS bring you to the emergency department today? And our patients who are frequently there have, they're very knowledgeable about the questioning, they're very knowledgeable about the medical system. And so a lot of times that leads to them kind of being um, detached from the system a little bit. So you'll frequently get these kind of answers. I don't know. And you'll kind of be like, well, I see that it looks like EMS was concerned that you were kind of passed out in the community. Someone called 911 and brought you in. And you kind of get this kind of, again, detached response, I guess. Um, and even then, now you try to kind of show some empathy towards the patient. Well, I see you're struggling with alcoholism. How much do you think you drank today? And then the patient, usually without even kind of giving a second thought, she's like, okay, severe. And then us as providers, we're trained with, if you're doing this, this is the solution. We tend to be very paternalistic in our responses to our patients. So then our next question are kind of at the end of this conversation is like, so are you interested in rehab? Do you want to go to rehab? Something kind of gearing them towards the goal that we have in mind because we know rehab will help them get better. So 
another, so one of the kind of second waves of psychiatry, so the first one would be kind of the Freudian theory, talking a lot about our childhood interactions, how they impact us today. Um, the second kind of um, psychological theory, start talking about, um, developed by a psychiatrist, Aaron Beck. And through him, he kind of talks about more of the here and now experiences that we have. Um, one of the biggest things he talks about is like core beliefs, kind of like this little core that I put, because we all have kind of um, beliefs that we have that at times we don't even realize um, that we're having or realize that sometimes we have errors in our core beliefs, but without being challenged on them, they're who we are and they kind of affect the way we think, interact with other people. Um, but having said that, so our core beliefs are triggered by all the things that we do in our lives. Um, they lead us to make assumptions about people, about the situations. Um, when we're interacting with challenging patients, especially, um, our core beliefs are just kind of firing off and they're affecting the way we're talking, we're thinking, we're interacting with this patient. Um, the patient has provided with all the information in the past about the harms of alcohol use. They've been given information for the rehabs, what they need you to get into rehab, how they can fund the rehabs. Um, they've been detoxed numerous times by us, um, but they still continue to present to the ED. Um, this type of patient can at times begin to make the clinician feel those same things we talked about with maternal deprivation. We can start to become to feel, let me talk about core beliefs, um, we can start to become to feel hopeless. It triggers some unlovability within our own selves, and it can also trigger our worth as a provider, um, which leads to us to have our own reactions of protest, despair, and detachment. Um, Aaron Beck's daughter, who's also, well, he's a psychiatrist, she's a psychologist, um, is the one who really kind of pin down the three core beliefs that people tend to have. Um, so when we're interacting with patients and we see them not getting better, because again, we're trained to, here's the problem, here's the solution, this is what you need to do. When we're providing patients with all the service, all the help that we can do, and they tend not to be following what we're saying, they tend not to be getting better, um, it can begin to make us feel as a provider a bit helpless. Um, unfortunately, with that helplessness, we can do and say a lot of things to kind of counteract that, to kind of preserve our own self. So we start using evidence. Well, I have so many years of training. I have these degrees. I have these certificates. Um, your colleagues would be like, yes, it's them. It's them, it's them. We have this, we have this, we're providing with this. And the patient is still not getting better. All those are kind of um, ways that we preserve our own self to say, it's them, it's them. But it's kind of counter our helplessness. Like I've done this, this, and this, and they're still not taking my advice. They're still not doing things to make themselves get better. So when we believe the patient is not improving, we definitely change that orientation and put that responsibility back onto the patient. Um, and then we begin to view the patient as being unhelpful. And unfortunately, we can also begin to view the patient as not having a lot of worth because they are doing this, they are doing this, they are not worth my time for me doing any more things to kind of emotionally help this person. And as Bowlby says, this leads to, in a sense, if we're the paternal figure in this situation, deprivation which leads to us having protests, us feeling despair regarding the situation, and us eventually detaching from the interaction we're having with the patient. And like I said, I know his theories are based on children, but I definitely think we adults reenact these situations all the time. Um, but like I said, in much more complex and developed subtle manners. Um, so what would adult protests kind of make us feel like? Um, when we protest as adults, we do things such as maybe complain, about what's with the situation. Um, sometimes it can be as kind of like seeing the patient. Sometimes our protests come in questioning, like why is this person even here? Why is this intoxication even brought to our ER? Why are they not taken to jail for being intoxicated? Um, we also start to protest in ways by like the way we ask patients questions. Um, as opposed to becoming more open-ended questions, how are you today? Um, our questions become more closed and more yes, no questions. Um, we find ourselves into more lecture to the patient, be more paternalistic and why aren't you doing this? This is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. Um, as opposed to kind of being more um, siding with the patient, asking them, what are your steps that you're willing to take to kind of get to the next level in your own health? Um, so the second stage that we talk about is despair. So first we kind of protest, we're kind of frustrated, we're kind of feeling hopeless and helpless with this patient, so we start doing things to protest. The next stage that we find ourselves kind of enacting as providers is kind of the despair stage, which I would describe as kind of um, feeling that they are helpless to assist the patient in, 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 in experiencing that. 
Um, I like the definition that I was able to find about positive despair, so our thoughts that lead to despairing things. Um, so limited future, limited positive expectations for the future, which leads to the clinician feeling excessive sadness, irritability, and kind of apathy towards the patient. Um, the last two qualities refer to the inability to experience pleasure and reward um, and lead us also to have a lack of motivation and action towards this patient. Um, this may look like the clinician going through the motion of seeing the patient and no longer making an effort to truly connect with the patient. Your eyesight is not there. You're not asking open-ended questions. Um, more complaint to the colleague about why is he here again, not him again. Um, your interaction with the patient also, while you're still... Researchers even show that our, our notes and our clinician skills still are very good no matter how many times we see this patient, no matter how many times we're frustrated, but some of the subtle things may start to change. As in, um, maybe you don't pay attention to some of the subtle things the patient is now saying. Um, you're asking your medical questions and that's kind of where the, the assessment kind of stops. Your eye contact maybe starts to decrease with the patient. Um, maybe you're saying, you're in your greeting, hi, Mr. Jones, how are you doing today? You're doing your son, okay, we'll do this kind of for you. But as far as the compassion in, this, in the greetings and the salutations starts to kind of decrease as well. Um, and so all those are kind of doing and showing examples of our lack of hope for this person's having a positive future, our hope of them actually getting better from the substance use. And lastly, the third stage of behavior action. Um, so when a patient, when a provider starts feeling detached, um, one definition is emotional, is a way to lower our own feelings of helplessness. It's a way that we kind of stop caring so we're not actually causing our, our harming our own kind of self-worth, our own self-value. That I like to kind of saying, no one can hurt you if you're not emotionally invested in what they're saying or doing. So, we all become emotionally invested in our patients, emotionally invested in their care and them getting better. But when you see a person continuously not getting better, it causes us to, to, to decrease our emotional attachment, our emotional um, involvement in this patient. So we ourselves aren't getting hurt. Unfortunately, this leads to the clinician then feeling feel like you start feeling kind of tired when you're working with this patient. Maybe your ability to concentrate on the interview is not as it would be if someone who you're really engaged and hopeful for their improvement. Um, and you start just feeling frustrated that they're not lacking progress and anger and that kind of leads to that kind of spiraling. Um, so, okay, back to Mr. Smith. What about his situation would make you feel helpless? What about this situation would make you feel worthless? Like make you feel that you have all this training and was it worth all these things that you've done and helped and he's still not getting better. So kind of jumping back to some of the first wave thought of psychiatry and therapy. Um, early childhood interactions. How are we as clinicians replicating some of these patterns that we've experienced and seen as, as children growing up? So I kind of put these two, we're mainly focusing on the girl because she's in both pictures. But for the first little girl in the upper corner, how do you feel like she's feeling about her own self-worth regarding her mother? So you see her mother is doing something on the computer, but her mother is still engaged with the children. She's hugging them. She's clearly talking with them. They all kind of have positive demeanors on their faces. And then you see the second photo. Is this a clinician who's frustrated with a patient who's like, okay, the patient's doing this, the patient's doing that, and I'm doing what I need to do. I'm interacting, I'm getting their medical history, I'm doing the, you know, but are you truly engaged and connected with this patient? And so we have a child with a different demeanor. So while this child has a happy demeanor, the second child's demeanor is kind of a negative demeanor. They're sad, they're not feeling good, but how engaged is the person who is working with them? How engaged is the clinician, or in this case, the parent with this child? Um, does the person even notice or care that the person isn't feeling good or feeling happy? Different emotions, especially sad and anger, can also be a way causes us to kind of separate more from the patient. And again, these family of origin experiences are, are relived and reenact in our daily lives, especially as clinicians. But being aware of them and how you respond, you just kind of detach, focus on your notes, focus on your work, not really engage like, oh, I see you feeling sad. Oh, I see that you're not feeling good. Um, so. Yeah. so if you're the provider for Mr. Smith, what would you tell yourself about him? So kind of what would be your thoughts about him? Would you begin to think, um, what would you think about the patient? What would you tell him, tell yourself about the worth of these patients? And the problem with some of these things is because, as we went back to like our medical ethics, 
these are not acceptable experiences, acceptable thoughts, acceptable things to be having about a patient. So at times they're very difficult for an individual to uncover. They're there and we are enacting them, but we don't acknowledge them because it's not acceptable in medicine. It's not acceptable to have negative connotations or thoughts about people, but they're there. And so it's important to kind of allow yourself to bring those to the service and talk about them. Um, what do you tell yourself about this person's worth? What do you tell yourself is a bad person, is a good person? Do you tell yourself, why is this person not in the legal system versus the medical system? Do you tell yourself, um, if they don't want help, then they can just leave. If you're doing all these things and they're not meeting you halfway, they can just leave. Are these some of the things that you're telling yourself about these interactions that you may be having with difficult patients? Um, how would you talk to him? Would you be kind of curt with him? Would you be kind of more scolding? Like, okay, you know, this is a problem for you. You know, this is happening. You know, this is happening. What would be your verbal tone with this patient? Um, and then how would you implement your job? Kind of back to that first kind of um, mental picture that we kind of gave ourselves. How would you do your job? How would you be exiting the room with this patient? So having said all that, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so when your core belief is not being um, in the negative mindset, when your automatic thoughts are one that aren't negative, patients can sense all that through your interactions and pick up on it, which also causes them to not get better in themselves because they don't feel like you actually truly care about them. So while it's, some patients are much easier to care about and to truly be connected with, patients on a whole um, won't listen to you, won't become engaged with you unless you truly care about them and, and their well-being and their improvement. Um, and while I do believe a person can be caught in some of these cycles of addiction, I kind of switch past just a little bit because I definitely think the addiction pathway and people's ability to get better from that and improve um, is really no different a challenge that I know any of you guys are overcoming right now in regards to um, just being here today because you guys all have busy lives, things that you need to be doing, things that you're trying to meet, um, as well as just the goal of embarking on medical school is just a very, or VA school, it's just a very arduous journey. Um, but it's like, hi, we kind of train on what we can kind of do to help you guys get through those things. Um, so one of the biggest lessons that we learned about theories of human behavior is that um, clinging to tightly to attachment theory proposed by late, jo by the late John Bowlby, um, relates to relationships humans have with each other and how those relationships lead to our social interactions and our emotions. Um, so another important aspect of treating a patient is identifying our own buried thoughts that interfere with our ability to form relationships with difficult patients. So change is hard. I would say that if you know medicine is a field that you're wanting to enter, that definitely having that compass is so important to moving forward in that work. Um, we question ourselves regarding our progress in getting to medical school and getting to PA school. We also question ourselves in progressing and helping patients. Am I intelligent enough? Do I get good accolades to kind of meet the standards that are being set forth? Um, do I need to help please others seeking out um, their emotions? Definitely COVID and everything that's been happening over these last few months has definitely thrown a curveball on all these things. But I definitely want to tell you guys, I'm so happy and so proud that all of you guys are here today, that all you guys are making this journey to your own self growth. But I'm trying to mirror that some of these things that clinicians struggle with are also some of the things that you struggle with just continually um, getting the challenge of getting into the next step of your journey. Um, so the view, our cognitions, our thought processes. The view you adopt for yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your life. The thoughts you have, lead to the actions that you do. So definitely working on those thoughts. So this is the first kind of half of like the pathology section, how things go wrong. Um, I want to leave this open for like questions right now. We have a lot of questions that, that, that came in. I, I guess one of the most more popular question was uh, how do medical schools sort of handle students with a history of mental illness? Is there still sort of a stigma when it comes to uh, comes to this and uh, how is this viewed by residency programs in psychiatry? So definitely. Um, so I know that, I can't speak to all medical schools, I can speak to the one that I went to. I know on our staff of our medical school, 
that we did have a psychologist that's actually on staff. So they were very involved in our medical school, um, kind of meeting with us from different times. And I know different, like UT Southwestern also has a clinic dedicated specifically to um, student health. So it's a clinic that you can go to and see psychiatrists. I believe they also have therapists through that clinic. So I definitely think um, medical schools are very attuned to students with mental illness, especially since mental illness can run the spectrum from kind of mild depression to more severe depression. Um, and there's definitely resources at schools, even in colleges, um, through their clinics to kind of help patients or help students with their mental health regarding therapy um, and regarding medication management if they need um, that for their mental health. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, I, I think it asks about how, how is this um, viewed by residency programs, uh, specifically in psychiatry? Um, so I definitely think mental illness, um, I don't think it's viewed negatively. I can think about when I sat on, when I was in my residency program and sat on those admission committees with us trying to review applications for residencies. Um, as you see, mental illness is prevalent within our communities. One in five people struggle with mental illness about 5% of those will have a severe mental illness. So I think it's something that is very attuned to programs. I don't think it's something they necessarily view as negative. Um, patients, people from time to time may have to take some time off from programs to kind of cope with their own mental illnesses before they're able to kind of get back to the level of functioning so they can perform well in their program. I don't think it's necessarily viewed as a negative because that's part of who we are as humans. And um, I think schools are really trying to attune themselves and acknowledge and, and seek out these, these students and get help for them so they don't necessarily impact their careers um, by not being able to progress because of their mental illness. All right, awesome. Um, and, and the next question, um, another popular question was, given that mental illness in the field of psychiatry have gotten more recognition in recent years, um, are subfields of psychiatry like what are subfields of psychiatry that you feel deserve more focus in today's environment? So is the question, what fields of psychiatry should be focused? Sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. It really, what, what, what subfields in psychiatry, perhaps given the culture of today, may be especially important? Addictionology, for example. So yeah, I think, um, Aspects of psychiatry, I can answer the question. I think aspects of psychiatry that are really heavily focused on are depression, anxiety, because definitely kind of the psychological model of addiction that as people's depression and anxiety become untreated and they have difficulty managing it, a lot of times they can turn to substance use to kind of address those. And then that in itself can lead to horrible consequences when you start becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol and trying to become um, a provider. So I definitely think the focus really should be on identifying and addressing and treating um, depression, anxiety, which sometimes can be the precursors to substance use. Nicole, you said something a while ago, you said that um, um, some enormous percentage of individuals are binge drinkers, but they are not alcoholics. I thought that was the same thing. <laughs> so in regards to like the old terms for addiction and abuse, or dependence and abuse and the new term we just use use disorder with our new DSM. Um, but the, the difficulty is, the difference is the consequences of the behavior. Um, and legal consequences are no longer considered to be a diagnostic criteria for substance use. And so while a person can binge drink, if the consequences of their behaviors are not where they're having problems with their family life, they're having problems with their work life, and having problems with keeping a job, then it wouldn't be considered a disorder. I have found over many years that patients tend to lie a lot about how much they consume. We actually have a phrase, and I actually, I saw it published somewhere, Nicole, I have to chase down that, uh, Reagan, we gotta remember where this was, that people admit to about one third of what they actually consume. Mm -hmm. What I saw published was actually about 40%, you know, based upon collateral from families. Any comment about that? Um, I think it comes with patients are, or people are just ashamed of acknowledging their own miscomings because um, I think growing up and in life, um, we don't want to feel shame or guilt. And so by acknowledging how much people are actually drinking, 
I think it causes us to feel worthless and it causes us to feel bad about ourselves. So people just try to put themselves in a better light. And some of this is very conscious, some of this is a little bit subconscious. Um, so I think that's where it's coming from. And so I tend not to fault the patient. I see it as almost a self-preservation way. They're trying to give themselves self-esteem and feel good about themselves in spite of them knowing that they're doing something that's not good for them. And some people, because some people, just, I honestly, I think that there's also a certain percentage you literally just don't know how much they're drinking because they just drink all day. It's just hard to even quantify for themselves. And they in themselves are even surprised. I drink how much? They just don't even, they don't even allow themselves to acknowledge sometimes how much they're drinking. So it's hard to be honest with the clinician when they're talking with them if they don't even acknowledge it themselves. Nicole, on a different subject, how, how did you decide to become a psychiatrist rather than a psychologist or a clinical psychologist? So for me, my path to psychiatry um, was not even something that I was thinking about until I got to medical school and actually rotated in psychiatry. Um, I initially really wanted to do like family medicine or internal medicine. Um, so that's why I didn't even, I did not take any psychology classes in college. Um, I was thinking primarily like medicine, family, internal, something of that nature. So you are the bright angel that comes to the ER when Gil and I are working. Uh, so often we have a patient, we see that guy also with you that we've seen 15, 20, 30 times every single day, often twice a day that are drinking themselves to death. And I, I find myself sort of kind of losing hope in that person. Do you ever lose hope in your patient? Um, so it's a definitely a very interesting question because I think all of us at time, well, I can say it specifically myself, I will lose hope in patients, but kind of the second part of the presentation is what can we do to kind of work on our mindset, our thought processes to help us reinstill hope in ourselves. Um, Cause definitely when I feel like we had a good connection with the patient, we really had these steps we're going to do, they're going to do A, B, C, and D. And then they come back two days later. I was like, what happened? So it definitely makes me lose hope in the patient. But part of what I do is what can I do to help myself kind of reinstill hope so that I can help get them hopeful about the future and kind of motivate them to kind of, okay, we messed up, but let's get the steps going again. So one of our students wrote in that said, this was their worst fear in medicine, which is how would you deal with the loss of a patient? Would it make you feel guilty? Um, so definitely in psychiatry, in medicine, um, we do lose patients. Does it make me feel guilty? Um, I definitely feel very sad when I lose a patient. And I think part of, unfortunately at times we do have cognitive dissonance where we just kind of suppress, push that away and don't think about it. But part of the goal is to be able to sit with that discomfort, sit with us knowing that unfortunately we've done everything we can and the person still passed. Um, I don't think I feel guilty about it because I guess how I feel guilty is that um, what I have done was not worth doing. I try to refocus on what have I done that actually helped the situation? What have I done that can, what can I do to learn to improve the situation where that means my ability to cope with it or my ability to help the next patient with the things that I learned from that person? So Nicole, you work around people, a lot of whom are just sort of crazy. How do you maintain your own mental health and don't go crazy yourself? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we're definitely going to talk about this the second half. So um, I definitely think working on my own mental health is really important. I think working on my own positive affirmations my, um, and putting those at the forefront of my day is really important. I think journaling is really important to be able to express how you're feeling, what you're thinking. Um, I think exercise is really, really important for that. Getting some kind of regular physical activity is really, really important. I think all of those things are important for developing your own mental health. So why don't we do one last question on the break here. What advice would you have for undergraduates, pre-meds, who want to get their foot in the door in working in psychiatry? Can they be a tech somewhere? Should they be reading all kinds of books? What should they be doing? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, so a person who, I guess this can be answered from a few different perspectives. One, a person who was just interested in learning more about psychiatry. Um, I think there's lots of wonderful 
people who are in the forefront of psychiatry right now. Um, there's Brene Brown. She does a lot of shame research. She's actually from Houston, works at UT, UT Houston. Um, there's also lovely websites. I love to go to like positive psychology. They have a lot of good kind of psychological material. There's the APA, the American Psychiatry Association. Um, there's Psychology Today. They have lots of good kind of articles about numerous topics. There's one thing to try to start building your awareness of psychological issues. I also think, um, especially when COVID kind of ends, as much as you can being involved in healthcare, because unfortunately, it's hard to know what it's like until you actually do it. It's hard to know if you feel like this is something that's gonna be your calling unless you've actually done it. So trying to get in when, when things kind of open up more with a provider that provides psychiatric care, see if you can't follow them. Um, I think those are probably some of the most important things. You said something, let me follow on to one thing you said because I just took a webinar on, uh, on the, the shame role or the shame activity that many physicians have where things have not gone well, or they've, you know, I mean, I've had patients, I mean, I've been doing this over two generations. I've, I've had patients that I sent home that did not do well, you know, and shame on me, you know, you had this sense of going home and kicking your own butt all the way home and feeling, you know, inadequate. How do we, just as one last comment before you go to your second half, how do we as physicians and as budding physicians prepare ourselves for this shame response? Um, I guess for me, I think it's hard to prepare because it's hard to know what the future holds. But I think when it's occurring, having, I like Brene Brown, she talks about having the courage to be able to talk about that because it's hard for shame to live in the shadows. If you have the courage to talk to your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers about these things, it allows you to one, get empathy from other people and when other people kind of empathize with you, they also can share their own um, aspects of things that they're kind of embarrassed about, shameful about. And having that community that this is that you're not alone and some of the experiences that you've had is really important for you to be able to work through and move through these experiences and allow them to become a tool of growth, not a tool of pulling back and um, causing you to be fearful of the future. What a wonderful response. Go, oh, this is just wonderful. Take it away for your second half, would you? Okay. Um, so again, progress, not perfection. Um, the second half of this lecture, I definitely want to focus on how we ourselves can improve our interaction with difficult patients, how we can stay engaged with our patients, how we can not lose hope in their improvement, and how we can continue to develop our own hope on our ability to help them. Um, so two different pictures that I really like, I kind of found these. But um, so when patients are difficult, like this young man is, does the clinician or the person pull away from them? As if she's doing kind of just turning her back, he's kind of this time she's actually actively reaching for her and she's still like no pulling away. Or when we have difficult patients, do we stay engaged with them? Do we continue to make eye contact with them? Do we continue to make a sense of calmness when we're talking with them, interacting with them, um, as opposed to pulling away from them? So one of the things, I love this book by Carol Dweck. It's about mindset. Um, so basically one of the definitions she gives for that is based on the belief that your basic qualities are things that you cultivate through efforts. So the journey to becoming a doctor and work with difficult patients is very hard. But in our ability to maintain effort and focus, we don't give up easily. We don't accept setbacks that discourage us and we continue to steadily improve our skill. We continue to steadily improve our emotional response to patients, our emotional feelings about situations, our interactions with patients. Um, so I love this little circle, spiral, however you wanna view it. It's a very cognitive model. So when we have events in our life, they lead to thoughts. We talk about automatic thoughts, the core beliefs, which then leads to emotions within ourselves which then leads to the behaviors that we then start to display through people and through our interactions. So as our goal is to progress towards being better, not necessarily being perfect, we start to struggle with these core beliefs, love versus unlovable, helping a patient establish their worth versus making them feel worthless. Um, kind of that internal locus of control. What can we control in the situation versus being helpless? There's nothing we can do. We just throw over hands. Everything is, is out of our control. 
Um, so kind of some of the things I liked about Love Global. I think it's important for us to always establish relationships with our patients. Um, this doesn't mean that our patients, that our, our staff, that our relationships are just, we're just blindly doing whatever the patient says, that they're without boundaries. Um, but I do think it's important to truly care emotionally for the person that you're serving. Um, medicine can be tough. We at times will suppress our emotions. We'll kind of push them to the side, not acknowledge them. Um, we won't deal with, as Dr. Powell was talking about, the loss of a patient. We won't deal with emotionally tough situations. Um, one of the biggest coping mechanisms we do is to just suppress, just push it away, put it in a box and don't think about it. But it's important to find a balance between that. Guess in the moment when you're having a person who's having a, a traumatic experience that might be important, but then you need to be able to go back, as I always say, open the box and explore the contents of the box, not just keep that box and keep stuffing more and more um, experiences that make you feel hopeless, make you feel worthless, make you feel bad into that box. Um, so to me, one of the things that's very important to work on is that balance between loving our patients um, and the thought process of love that goes along with this. So I found these three quotes that I just really enjoyed. Um, one is, sorry, <laughs> happy existence. One is love. The other is finding a way to of coping with life that does not push love away. With those two people in the interaction, what are we doing to still stay engaged in the situation, even though the other person might not be giving us the best response back? How do we stay connected and meaningful? Um, and then the surprise findings that relationships and how happy we are in our relationship has a powerful influence on our own health. So I think us being able to have engaging, meaningful, purposeful relationships with our patients impacts our own health. It impacts our ability to enjoy our work. It impacts our ability to continue to grow in our work. Because if you don't feel that what you're doing is meaningful, you tend to just do something else. And so when you're at home and you have time to study, as you become providers, what are you doing with that time? Are you still continually engaging with those patients? So how do we learn to kind of love our, our patients? So I begin with the question of going back to Mr. Smith, who is this person, he's sitting in front of you. Um, how have they gotten to this moment in time? That's one thing that I really try to focus on is not the acute situation that we're seeing in front of us, but how did this person's life transpire to get to this point in time? One of the movies, what is that movie that we watched about? Um, La Miserable. I don't know if ever you guys have seen, it's a movie, it's a play, it's a musical, but it really um, kind of talks about the trajectories that people can have when sometimes with good intentions, things just start going wrong in their life and how this can just spiral down. So I think always trying to understand who this person is, not just the person acutely in front of you that's been here multiple times, is really important for you to try to show love and compassion towards that person. Um, one thing that I always try to do to show love and compassion to people I do find challenging is one, to understand their background as much as I can, always trying to dig deeper. What happened? What happened? How was this? How was this experience for you? Um, one thing I like to do to kind of cognitively reframe them in my brain is I really identify them as my friend. Oh, my friend is here. So I really try to put a positive mindset on myself. This is a friend. I see them all the time. How are they doing today? Um, one thing I also like to do to try to change my mindset and try to get me to I can truly love this person and truly engage with them um, is me personally, I'm a very tend to be happy, bubbly person. So I tend to find songs that really make me care about this person. So I'll kind of walk down the hall and say, you're going to see. So I'm really trying to enjoy and rev myself to have an enjoyable experience where I show positivity and joy and love to this person as I'm going to see them. So songs can really help you with that. And then really questioning yourself about what is the problem this person is struggling with? What is the problem this person is struggling with? Because sometimes the problem is actually not obvious. And at times it's even hidden to the patient. So constantly kind of being this, this digger, trying to dig, trying to excavate, trying to understand, and really asking, how can I help them today? And also defining what help is. So sometimes help, I know Dr. Fowler liked to kind of talk about this, what is actually help? Sometimes help is just honestly just being happy to see this person. How are you doing today? And honestly just giving them a warmth greeting. Because sometimes, especially people who have spiraled down in their life are really um, pushed aside by a lot of people in life. They have difficulty going to the store to buy things. People look at them like, why are you here? What are you doing? Are you here to steal things? So they're filled with a lot of kind of negative views and connotations by people saying mean, mean things to them. So to really 
view this person in high regards and a positive regard can sometimes be all that you can do for health them that day. That might be all that they really wanting is just someone just to say, hi, how are you? I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy to see that you're here today. Um, so I think trying to keep some of those positive thoughts that kind of transmit love to a patient is really important. Um, our actions. Um, being sincere in hoping this person's well-being, their emotional well-being as well as their medical well-being, no matter how many times you've seen them. Inquire about their goals, not just giving them a goal. What is your goal? Because sometimes patients have goals, but because life has been so challenging for them, um, they give up hope in even achieving that goal. Sometimes because life has been challenging, they have difficulty eating. I, call, I like to do like problem solving therapy with them. What steps do you need to take to be able to achieve this goal? Some people have extreme difficulty, especially if getting like depression, anxiety, and hopelessness on top of that, even putting one thing in front of the other. First, you need to do this, then you need to do this. And regarding those goals, what gets in the way of them achieving them? Some people, because they lack confidence, well, there's no point in me trying that because that's not going to work because it's like, well, no. What can we do to help encourage them to even seek those goals? Um, what are they wanting help with? Um, what is getting in their way? We kind of talked about that. And then one thing I always think is important to do is we always talk about, I don't know if you guys are ever familiar with like the Mars Maslow's hierarchy of pyramid of hierarchy. The first base of anyone's kind of being able to like achieve self-worth um, or self-accusation, like somebody calls it, is basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, family, basic needs. Does this person even have adequate food? When's the last time they ate? It's hard to even think about what steps you need to take to get better if you're hungry. Giving them a sandwich, offering them something to drink. One, it shows compassion for this person. It shows that you value them and it just allows them to feel emotionally better. When your glucose is low, it's you're irritable, you're frustrated, you can't think. So making sure that we're kind of offering food to patients is really important. Um, sometimes it's hard to think, especially with inclement weather, we're getting ready to move into the winter season. Is this person cold? Is this person not even appropriately dressed for the weather conditions? Do they even have access to appropriate clothes to be able to get, you know, when's the last time they had a shower? Some of these small things can really improve a person's mood. Um, so I think not minimizing some of those just basic human needs. Um, and all of us have a need for friendship, for love, for friends, for communication, for attachment to other people. Does this person feel like you even care enough to want to attach them? Even if it's for five minutes, even if it's for two minutes, you're just kind of walking by and, you know, kind of acknowledging them and showing them respect. Do they even feel that you're, you're caring towards them? Um, and one thing I always like to do with patients is honestly, even if they're displeased because maybe I'm not doing what they want, um, I still always wish them a good day. I still always will, even if they're kind of frustrated, well, sir, what else can I do to be helpful for you? What else are you wanting me to do that I'm not doing for you right now? Maybe it's something I'm willing to do, maybe it's something I'm not. But not being frustrated with them when they're making these demands, because even as you kind of go back to that child, they still need to be loved. And if you're not loving them, it's causing them to feel rejected and, they cause, and it causes them to react in a way and it makes them not feel good, which also inhibits their ability to get better because they feel like no one in the world cares about them. So I think also at the end of the day, it's just literally just wishing them a good day and sincerely and honestly wishing they have a good day today and, and hopefully they're able to make a progress towards whatever that progress may be towards their next step. Um, so things to kind of do regarding patient self-worth. Um, so I kind of found this article that I really like. Things that are important for people's self-worth, their ability. Um, not to be overstated, but when you achieve goal A, it gives you confidence to achieve goal B. If our goal is to help this person get sober and they're like, I don't even know what I need to do, Maybe our first goal is having to develop a plan and they congratulating them. Wow, you came up with a plan today. Maybe that was their whole goal. Maybe that was their first step is us helping you come up with a plan that you take ownership of and think, wow, I actually have something that I can do as opposed to just saying, why aren't you going to rehab? Why aren't you going to rehab? I don't know. Giving them something to start building those, um, those rewards on because humans, as you develop step one and you feel good about yourself, it allows you to take a bigger risk and a bigger risk and a bigger risk. Because some of these people, honestly, um, because they've been so rejected by society, rejected by family, friends, people around them, even taking the risk of asking a question becomes challenging. Even taking the risk of filling out an application to go to rehab is challenging. And they're just like, but I've had all these evidence for why this is not even worth doing. 
So we really have to start building their confidence over time so that they can start taking challenges to help themselves get better. Um, the effort you put forth is another thing that's really important. So sometimes, yes, this person is a chronic alcoholic, but maybe today they're like, you know, I actually decided I want to quit drinking. Will they be able to maintain that? I don't know, but allowing them to be congratulated for even putting forth the effort to come in today. I think all those things build a person's self-worth. The performance they're doing, they made it here today. I am so proud of you. Congratulating them and acknowledging those things are really important for building a person's self-worth so that they over time can start getting better because there's so many little small challenges that they have to overcome to even get better, to even deal with the cravings and the, the, the feelings of withdrawal that they don't want to experience. They don't want to experience pain. So we're trying to convince them and motivate them and encourage them that these small steps are important to building that future and, and eventual um, improvement that you're hoping to get. Um, we're kind of skip over this slide. But um, so pessimism. <laughs> A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficult situation. And so again, back to self-worth, encouraging people, seeing those small smidges of hope um, and trying to encourage them and give them um, confidence. Like we do with little kids, we congratulate every small little thing they do. I have a 22 month old. Oh my gosh, you took the step. Oh my gosh, you threw that in the trash. And we help them and we, we don't do it for them, but we encourage them and our substance users and our people who are kind of in this spiral of continuously doing the same thing need those, so, those small changes to kind of help them get better too, those small piece, pieces of encouragement. Um, so kind of agency versus helplessness. Um, again, the same thing encouraging even the smallest things because change is so hard it can be very self-defeating you can do 10 great things do one small misstep and everything falls apart and unfortunately because humans tend to view it's easier for us to view negative things than to view positive things we spend 90 percent of our time focusing on that one negative thing other than those other nine things that we did great and wonderful oh i was sober for three months oh, I went to a party because I thought I could handle drinking three beers. And next thing I know, I relapse on 10. Do we encourage this person and say, yes, you were sober for six months. What did you do to maintain that sobriety for so long? And help them say, what can we do to quickly get you back on track? As opposed to say, well, here you are again. <laughs> Even emotionally, physically, and in our, in our demeanors, encouraging this person, really giving them hope for the future and supporting them. Um, so your problem is you're afraid to acknowledge your own beauty. You're not too busy holding on to your unworthiness. So kind of the same thing we were just talking about, acknowledging them, allowing them to have the joy in those things too. So what actionable things can we do to help reinforce a person's self-worth? Um, focus on the person in front of us, not on what they're not doing. This person is present, this person is alive, this person is breathing, this person is engaging with us. They're actually answering questions and not just kind of giving these, as we talked about earlier, I don't know, these without thought questions, focusing on the person who's actually present in front of us. Um, we kind of talked about unconditional love, respect, and positive. Um, and kind of going back to the increasing your understanding of this person. What is their life situation? What has led to this point today? Um, allowing yourself to forgive yourself as well as forgive them for some of their shortcomings and mistakes. Um, positive self-talk is really important. The evening with maybe a student, but you know, today was challenging, but I think tomorrow you can do better. I think tomorrow will be a better day for you. I think leaving patients with those positive words is really, really important too. Um, and taking responsibility, allowing them to acknowledge their shortcomings and be able to acknowledge, and almost what we call like a safe space being able to acknowledge that sometimes we're not perfect and we make errors. You've made an error, but that's okay. Let's get you back on track and giving them kind of the hope for the future, which also improves their own self-worth. Um, these are just some other talks that you, the organization looking like this. It's a really good TED talk on the long, on a study on happiness um, and the connection that um, having with other people um, that, loneliness kills and that loneliness can actually be just as big a risk factor for morbidity and mortality as things such as like smoking and alcoholism. So a lot of our patients, when they're in um, the depths of their illness, in the depths of their substance use, um, because of the consequences of those things have been isolated from people. They're isolated from family, they're isolated from friends. Um, it's hard for them to even get like a, a nice 
smile or regard from person walking by on the street from them. They kind of look down, look away, as opposed to just being acknowledging them, saying hi, and kind of moving on. All those things really affect a person um, in our interactions with people. Some of the early studies by like Bowlby were actually on hospitalized children and how these children were provided with all of the basic necessities that they needed, but were not provided with adequate touch, adequate love. So they have like rooms full of like 40 sick children. You have one nurse caring for the oh, make sure this person has their ball, make sure this person being fed. But when no one's actually picking up this person, loving them, engaging with them, um, they actually lead to failure to thrive. And I definitely think that could be extrapolated to our patients who are difficult patients. When society, when people and clinicians are not truly caring about this person, they then don't care about themselves. It's hard for them to get better and hard for them to have hope. Um, so really acknowledging it and being aware of some of those kind of pitfalls that kind of people can fall into. Um, so working on your own mindset. And I definitely think working on it is important, but also being able to monitor it is really important. Because it's definitely easy for all of us to kind of um, go on a tangent, be taken away with life, be taken away with what's going on around us without really saying, is the path I'm traveling the path I truly want to be going down? Um, and I also love this saying by Henry Ford, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So tracking your mindset, tracking your thoughts, am I doing, am I living the life that I want to, is the interaction I have the one that I'm intending to have, not the one that I'm having, is it the one I'm intending to have? So for us, for patients, negative thoughts are prevalent. Working on replacing those negative thoughts with positive ones is really important for interaction with patients. Um, I think as they were asking, what can you do to kind of mental health? I'm a big proponent of having positive messages around. Um, I'm a big proponent of journaling. Every day I journal, I start off, I usually, some people do once a day. I find it's easier to do one positive message, positive affirmation once a week at the top of my journal every day progress, not perfection, whatever it might be. Um, and use that to reinforce. I know I've read some one, um, what is her name? Erin Beck's daughter, had one of her books, she actually remains having a little note card, putting on your note card and having a positive message. Why am I doing this? What is my goal? What am I working towards that you can kind of look at and reinforce every day? Um, it's great to put those things on PowerPoint, put it on your phone. You can kind of just quickly kind of look at every couple hours just to kind of make sure, am I going in the direction I'm meaning to go with myself, with my patients, with my interactions? Um, I think it's also important to view challenges as exciting, not to view challenges as validation of one's self-worth. Um, Carol Dweck talks a lot about that, that challenges occur, but it's our willingness to enjoy the challenge and to be engaged in that challenge that helps us overcome those challenges. Um, so again, just kind of talked about weekly affirmations, mantra, scriptures, focus on one a week. When you're seeing patients, what is the thought that's kind of going through your mind that you can kind of supersede? You know, this person can't get better. Are you telling yourself that? So what can I do to help them find that little, that little nugget of hope to kind of help them move forward in their progress? What are you telling yourself? What words are you saying? What words are you writing and telling yourself repeatedly? Um, and verbalize. I think self-acceptance of our own faults, our own shortcomings is really, really important. Um, as I said earlier, we can't grow what we don't know or acknowledge. Um, talking to friends, you can have um, someone to share with, someone that can empathize you, help you reframe. Because sometimes when things start going wrong, um, the stories we tell ourselves can be filled with like a lot of falsitudes that we don't even realize are false and negative. And allowing ourselves to share that with other people, a close friend, a therapist, like I just, whoever that may be, is really important for reframing and being able to acknowledge and be able to sit with that discomfort and make it a part of our challenge that we're overcoming as opposed to just saying, this is hurt, this is bad, this is, I'm just gonna stop and go the other direction. And allowing, I call it like a little box to just continuously build and build and build until it itself explodes. Um, and so journaling is really important. Um, and I mean like journaling like, two hours a day, but you know, just 20 minutes. Sit down. I love to do like, um, for me in the morning, every day, most days, I like to positive affirmation, journal, sit in silence for just a few minutes. All this could take like 20 minutes, do some kind of brief movement exercises and then move forward with the day. I think all those things are important for working on our own mental health and monitoring our journeys that we're making sure we're moving in the direction we want to move without just kind of passively moving around life and life just happening to us. Um, 
So that's all that I have for today. So I just want to thank you guys very much for inviting me. Um, I have these few quotes, some of them positive, some of them negative, that can be things we tell ourselves um, that we can work on kind of acknowledging so that we can move in a good direction with ourselves. Um, so one, a lot of these are like quote Carol Dweck's book who I really like, but um, believing that your qualities are carved in stone is a fixed mindset. Um, it creates an urgency to prove yourself over and over again. Look smart, don't look dumb. Some of these kind of things that we do in our lives, especially when you go through medical training. Because medical training is so rigorous, because um, the consequence of us not being, um, the consequences of us making errors can be so severe, at times we tend to hide our errors. And so we have this, this assumption that we have to look smart, we have to look smart, don't look dumb. Um, so I think challenging those beliefs in ours is really important. Um, challenging the belief that every conf every situation is a confirmation of our intelligence, personality, your character. Every situation is evaluated. Will I succeed or fail? Will I look smart or dumb? Will I be accepted or rejected? Will I be a winner or a loser? I think really um, acknowledging that we have some of these thoughts that go through us and evaluating them for, am I making progress? It's not about winning or failing. It's not about being smart or being dumb. It's not about being accepted or rejected. It's about progress. It's about continuously working, continuously moving forward in our lives with our patients, with ourselves. Um, so kind of more positive view. Why waste time proving over and over again how great you are when you could be speaking better? Why hide deficiencies instead of overcoming them? Medicine is a constantly changing field. It's a constantly changing, it's a constantly changing knowledge base. Um, you will change over time. You will grow over time. And so how are you acknowledging those things and continuously working towards them? Um, kind of like this one too. Why seek out the tried and true instead of experiencing those things that will stretch you? Um, sometimes we find in life challenging patients, challenging situations, challenging careers that we tend to want to do the easy thing as opposed to doing something that stretches us, that challenges us, that we may not have um, perfected, but it's hard to get better at something that you don't allow yourself to experience. Seeing that patient that maybe looks hard, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, go for it. Especially in training, you have providers who are around you, providers who are um, there to help you, guide you. Don't be afraid to kind of seek out something because it looks challenging or it's novel or, or you know, it's new. Um, and lastly, the passion for stretching yourself and sticking to it, even when it's not going well, is the hallmark of a growth mindset. So even when things are not going well, even when these seem challenging and, and insurmountable, um, keep going, keep striving, um, and keep growing. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Um, I was reading something about it. Um, a, a fellow did a, for, for one of the newspapers did an interview with a bunch of billionaires and got quotes. Oh, by the way, everybody, please put thank you into chat for Nicole. Let's see if we can get 800 thank yous. Um, let, let them pour in there. Just look at the chat, uh, Nicole. It'll make your heart feel warm. Uh, Nicole, you've been speaking to 1,243 students live online, and we just love you to death. I've got several questions, uh, and we won't keep you much longer. You've, there are 800 thank yous coming into chat. <laughs> Nicole, do you think that the demand for psychiatry will continue to grow in the next few years? After all, we are seeing increases in opiate overdoses and suicides and so forth. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in pediatrics today. What do you think? Um, do I think the increase for demand in psychiatry will continue to increase? Um, I do think the increase, I do think... <laughs> People, one, need to be aware that mental illness exists in the community and in themselves. So I think first, allowing it to be more mainstream and more acknowledged is important. And if people allow themselves to accept their own limitations, their own deficiencies, that will allow them to seek help. And if people in society accept people not being perfect and able to accept their own deficiencies, I do think mental health will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. But if people move to the mindset of I'm perfect, there's nothing wrong with me, um, it doesn't allow them to seek help. And so it doesn't allow the field to grow. We've got a couple of questions about racial identity. Nicole, how has your own identity as a woman of color impacted your career or has it in any way? Um, I 
definitely think being an African-American female um, and my own racial identity has impacted my career. In psychiatry, it definitely is thrown into the forefront of what we do. Um, definitely dealing with patients, it comes up quite frequently in regards to um, how you view society around you, how you view um, things that get in your way of progress, how you view your own self-worth, I think has a lot to do with your own self-identity, um, as well as just your direct, I can just talk about my direct interaction with patients, how um, at times certain racial profiles will quickly identify with me. And that's based upon their own views of their own like, oh, you're African-American, you're gonna understand me better. Um, and so sometimes you get the opposite. Oh, you're not, you're African, but you're not gonna understand anything I'm talking about. And so we deal a lot with that in psychiatry and working on patients. So I don't know everything about you, but my goal is to understand you. And that comes from the racial makeup, your cultural makeup. And so um, helping patients and myself understand their cultural backgrounds and how that affects their views of life, their interactions with other people is really important. Um, another question I think that is pretty popular is, uh, what's your day in life for you? Do you see patients over a period of time or, or do you mostly do consults? So in the ER, so Park, again, because Parkland is a very large hospital, I think our ER setup is pretty unique, I would think. Um, so one, we do consults, but our ER also has two units in our ERs. So we will see patients sometimes as we're trying to transfer to a psychiatric hospital. At times they will remain in our ER for days, that's not uncommon. And so we will get to see patients trajectory of their mental illness over days at times. So we do have like the one-time view where we see them and maybe they get admitted to medicine or maybe they get discharged, but we also will have some small continuity in care where we see them for days over time before they get transferred to a psychiatric hospital. But I don't think that's typical of an ER, but it is ours, so ours is so large. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you often incorporate preventative or in, uh, integrative medical approaches in your practice? Preventive and integrative. Um, do we do preventative care? Um, I don't think we do as much preventative care in the ER setting because I only work in an ER where people are coming in in acute um, stress situations, um, whether being brought in by police or their family or themselves as rather bring themselves in. So we don't do so much prevention as we do more acute crisis stabilization as our focus. Um, and as far as kind of integrative care, um, we're kind of referring people out to the clinics more for kind of integrating with other healthcare professionals. Because Parkland is such a large interconnected system, we can at times, depending on what's going on with them, get them connected with other um, referral sources while they're in the ER, but that's kind of our, we focus more on acute civilization really than prevention or integrating with other services. Another question, um, uh, this one's interesting. So ask like what sort of skill sets you need in order to assess and treat patients that often have like an impaired decision-making capacity. Hmm. Uh, and there's a follow-up question to this. I'll, I'll probably ask after. Um, okay. Yeah. So impaired decision-making capacity. Um, that's an actually an interesting question because it's not an absolute response. It's a very gray area as far as what you mean by impaired decision-making capacity because are we talking about a person who has a cognitive impairment like dementia? Are we talking about a person who has some cognitive impairment like schizophrenia? Are we talking about a person who has a, an acute or a short change in their decision-making capacity, like someone who comes in um, confused, delirious due to medical problem, due to substance use? Um, and so depending on the situation, the consequence of their impaired decision-making, um, it, impa it impacts how we respond. And so one, the skills that you have to develop is you have to have a good foundation of medical knowledge to understand, first of all, the pathology of what is going on with the person in front of you. The other skill set you have to also develop is actually judgment, which to me, judgment is based upon experience and the consequences of things, what can happen in certain situations. Um, so to answer that is kind of hard, but 
the skill set would just be practicing medicine and understanding consequences of behaviors and consequences of things and what this person is struggling with the decision in front of you. All right. And, and there's a, and a segue to that uh, first question was, how do you, what are the appropriate steps that you usually take uh, when you're trying to restore patient autonomy um, and at the individual and maybe even the community level? Individual and community level. Um, yeah, some of these are very challenging questions. Um, I don't know if I have the best answer to how to restore a patient's autonomy. Um, definitely autonomy is something we speak about a lot in psychiatry. And so, I mean, medicine in general, yes. Yeah. And so I think one thing for autonomy is giving the patient information is really important because it's hard to have autonomy when you just don't understand what's going on around you. <clears throat> so I think one, educating a patient is really important. So we always talk about informed consent, um, truly educating them on what the pros and cons of whatever we're trying to convince them or not convince them to do is. Um, and then as far as the community, I think it just goes back to education because the more educated a person is about what's going on, um, the better decision they're able to make. Nicole, you commonly have to decide if a patient is harmful to themselves or others. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, we have to take away their autonomy if we feel like that they may injure themselves. Mm -hmm. As you well know, we see suicidal ideation, we call it all the time. And mm -hmm. we have, and you, you are the expert in going in to determine if the patient has a real plan, if they have access to implements or medications that could in fact harm themselves and so forth. Could you follow on to that for a sentence or two, just to comment? So definitely, definitely when we talk about autonomy in that sense, um, we definitely do in psychiatry, if we have concern about a person's ability to harm them, not harm themselves or harm other people, we definitely can put them on what's called like an involuntary hold, either by the police will do that or we do that through the courts. Um, and so in regards to that, how do we determine um, if people are saying the exact same thing, how do we determine who is an imminent risk of harm to themselves versus who is not an imminent risk of harm to themselves? And basically how we do that is one, through the patient assessment. Truly understanding what this person's motivations are is really important um, because a person can be motivated, one, in an acute situation by something that once it's kind of reframed and kind of spoken with them, they kind of say, what was I thinking? What was going on? And truly are acknowledging that this was an error on their part, that this was something that occurred quickly. So understanding a person's motivations, understanding their world and how they're interacting with their world is important. And then also, because at times patients will hide things from us, um, hide things because they want a certain outcome to occur. I think it's important to really talk to family and friends to try to understand what's going on. So our decisions are based on speaking with the patient, interviewing the patient, trying to get as, big, as much of an understanding of who they are as a person, why things are happening in their life the way they are, as well as talking to an outside source who knows this person to try to understand and put those pieces together and come up with a plan that kind of makes sense to say, what is this person's risk factor? And at what point in time do I need to take away their autonomy to keep them safe so we can help treat them so they can get better? You know, Nicole, changing subjects, I admit people to the hospital all the time with all sorts of medical complaints. Um, and we generally, generally, not always, have enough inpatient resources to be able to care for our patients. Oh, two or three years ago, the state of Texas closed what several, a couple of hundred inpatient psychiatric beds, which put us in a world of hurt for inpatient psychiatric care. What is your perspective on the adequacy of what we, what we need for inpatient care, I, that's not a very good question, but I'm just saying, do we have enough or, or do we have to just line patients up to get in line to, to, to get an available bed? Um, I think the availability of beds, the availability of funding for psychiatry is definitely something that I wish was better, was more to what I feel the need is. Definitely Texas compared to other states, we have the 49th least funded psychiatry in the US. So that greatly impacts the care our patients can receive. I also think 
medicine at times kind of misconstrues psychiatry. And I call it kind of the medicalization of psychiatry. And fortunately, psychiatry is not something that can be like, this is the problem. This is what needs to be done. We do this two, three days and it's fixed. A lot of times the brain just doesn't work that way. It takes the brain a while to be able to grow those neurons, to be able to change. You have to have a situation in which um, the chemicals, so we talk about like medications and then growing the neurons in the brain, that takes time, as well as the situation you're in has to change. And none of those things happen quickly. And so sometimes um, we expect or wish or want a quick resolution to something that is probably like months or years of change that needs to occur. And the person needs support to be able to do that. And so sometimes it's not just the adequacy of the absolute number of beds we have, but sometimes it's the length of stay that people have. Um, it's just not set up for how the brain functions. Not too long ago, I had an experience of a young person that came to see me who had overdosed over and over and over again. And I have to admit, I was annoyed and I called y'all to come help me with this person who clearly has a depression problem, was also schizophrenic or something. And I was talking to a resident friend of mine and he said, well, why does that let, why does that bother you so much? And I said, well, because this person could really help himself. He says, well, you don't get annoyed about the diabetic patient who's really a brittle, frail diabetic who comes in time and time again, but you're letting yourself get annoyed a bit about someone who keeps harming themselves. He said, really in the final analysis, it's just a different part of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> he was right, you know, and I, I've got to work on that, Nicole. So uh, I'm going to keep calling you to help I'm growing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep you to keep calling you to come talk me off a ledge. Nicole Gutierrez, you are the light in my life in the in that crazy, wide, wild, wide open emergency department there at Parkland. Uh, Gil Salazar, are you still out there? Speak up if you are. I am. Um, Thank you. Uh, I please, really please. appreciate you. Um, Nicole, this was a phenomenal presentation and I'm always in awe and learn uh, from you guys every time we get your services.